the greatest graceful way we can. Amen. Good morning. And now let us approach the throne of grace with awe and reverence. Gracious Father, Mother God, we come to you this morning in a spirit of gratitude and thanks for being able to assemble together yet one more time in your witness. We thank you, God, this morning for celebrating a spirit of legacy. For the Urban Theological Institute represents legacy for all God's people. And God, we thank you that in the midst of this is what we are learning and lecturing experience. We may yet experience you, God, through the speaker, through your word, through the wisdom and understanding and knowledge that will come forth in this particular place, in this very space. God, and we would also be fitting and, and, and negligent if we were not to welcome at this time the Holy Spirit to dwell with us in this place. And now, God, with no further form or fashion, we thank you for he who occupies the endowed chair, for the predecessor who established it, and for the legacy of the birthday of the one who is yet with us today in this, in this world, and that would be Jeremiah Wright, Jr. Now, God, now, God, right now, we ask your blessings for he who will speak to us, that we may have ears to hear, minds to absorb, and spirits to do what you would have us to do. In the matchless name of Christ, our Savior, and the people of God will say three times, amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. Dr. Dr. Green and to faculty and staff, uh, trustees, students, ministers, and friends who have gathered. Um, it is a pleasure for me to present, not introduce, but present a lecturer. And as I look over the room, it, it appears to me that I may have known him longer than anyone else in the room, even longer than 13-year-old Dr. Q. <laughs> um, we met first in the Garden State uh, while I was pastoring in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and he came to the pulpit of uh, the St. Paul Baptist Church in Montclair, and uh, we became colleagues and friends over those years. And then I remember when he heeded God's leading to leave the Garden State and become pastor of another uh, noted and prestigious church, the Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, if you want to know something about the man, uh, note his mentors and teachers, those who have informed him and filled him. I'll name a few. Gardner C. Taylor. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, William Augustus Jones, and most recently departed from us, James Cohn. And then after uh, a successful and influential pastorate and leading the NAACP in Cleveland, when most of us would uh, retire to a comfortable recliner, uh, he took on the responsibility of the presidency of Colgate Rochester Crozer a Divinity School where he led our school through some very difficult and challenging times because it is a challenging time for theological education, especially for seminaries and divinity schools that, that, uh, that are prophetic. Uh, and engage uh, their students and society in issues of social justice. And just as those uh, persons I mentioned uh, fed him and filled him, uh, he has in turn filled and fed thousands of parishioners and students over the years through his preaching, 
his teaching, and his prolific writing. And so we are delighted and privileged today to welcome him to this place and, and for this lectureship as he comes to us now, Reverend Dr. Marvin A. McMichael. Thank you so much. It is a delight to be here, Dr. Green. Greetings to you and uh, Quentin Robertson. Thank you for facilitating uh, the invitation and, uh, and my coming to be a part of these proceedings on today. To all of you who are gathered for this significant occasion, good morning to all of you and uh, greetings in the Lord's name. There are some really good friends here that I've known for even longer than I've known uh, you. <laughs> I was 13 once, but it was, <laughs> it was 57 years ago, so I've kind of forgotten what it was like. But um, I'm going to just start on this end and work my way down because this whole front row is sort of a uh, friendship row. Uh, Dr. Wayne Croft, who teaches here, I was fortunate over the years to preach for him in two different locations and to be involved with him in uh, his first publication and uh, have, a, have had an early glimpse at the second book that's coming out and look forward to that. James Buck recently got his doctorate from Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School and is now pastoring at Grace Baptist Church where I will be preaching on tonight, uh, so good to see him. And then uh, J. Wendell Mapson is the reason that I went to Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School, because he was on the search committee and they were having a difficult time finding anybody who was really qualified <laughs> for the job. So uh, they went down to the second tier and, uh, and uh, that's where they found me and uh, so I thank, I thank him for his friendship and, of course, his wonderful ministry at Monumental Baptist Church, where I've also been on several occasions. I'm going to go back two rows to uh, Frank Tyson. Frank um, was one of our trustees. Uh, he was actually an alum of Crozer Theological Seminary, but when the two schools merged in 1970 uh, and Crozer was sort of moved up into Colgate Rochester complex, it then became CRCDS, and he carried on that legacy along with uh, Dr. Maps, and who was also a Crozer alum. And uh, they were both faithful members of our board of trustees until they rotated off. Dr. Maps is about to become a life trustee, I think, uh, next month, and so we thank God for that. And then uh, right in front of me, there's always got to be a student who sits right in front of you. <laughs> To, uh, you know, to see what you're going to do, you know. So Clarence Wright is currently a doctoral student. Uh, he's at, was it Love Temple? Love Zion a Church here in Philadelphia, and uh, he's in a class that uh, I'm working on this, um, this current semester, a D-Men intensive, so I'll see him regularly for a little bit next month, but I'm reading papers uh, as they come in. And he is keeping up with his reading schedule, so I can, uh, there's, uh, there's every hope, every expectation that he will pass the course. Uh, and if he does right, he might even get the degree. So we'll, uh, it all depends on what he does today. If he, if he says amen at the right time, he'll help him. So um, if I get this uh, slideshow to start, there we go. I might need technical assistance up here. Slideshow, oh, from the beginning, all right. From the beginning. From the beginning. Okay, there we go, all right. So, um, what I want to do <clears throat> is start by simply reflecting on a book that has been finished, which is called The Making of a Preacher. And then I want to I segue from that into a book 
that I'm now working on, um, the title of which is what is it going to be? Uh, Rebecca Irwin Deal from Judson Press is back there. Uh, she will decide what the title of it is going to be. <laughs> Whatever it is, we're going to talk about it today. So in the making of a preacher, which there are no slides for that because I'm going to move through it rather quickly. In the making of a preacher, I make the case, as the title would suggest, that preachers are not born. They are made. Nobody is born with the skill set, with the depth of spirituality, with a predisposed theological disposition. All those things happen as they are molded by time, by encounters with other people, by the natural maturation process, both in the church and in the body, as they grapple to find their own voice, as they find ways to look out onto the world and make up their mind about what they see and what they want to say about what they see. Preachers are not born. You might be born with certain physical talents, gifts of voice, um, size, uh, clever, witty intellect. But wit and size and tone do not make a preacher. And I wish I could convince younger preachers that that is the case. That wit and size and tone and melody and rhythm do not constitute the building blocks of a long-term ministry. There are other things that have to go into it. So what I have done in this book, The Making of a Preacher, is to take Moses in Exodus chapter 3 as a test case. And suggest from Moses that there are five components to the making of a preacher. Component one is the call. I belong to that generation of people who believe that preaching is not the work of volunteers. Uh, that anybody in their right mind that wants to have a long and happy life would never volunteer to do this. As a matter of fact, when I was uh, toying with the idea of being called to the ministry, when I was 16, I was three years older than you were at that time, when I was 16, I was told by almost everyone with whom I consulted, if you can be happy doing anything else but this, do something else but this. But if you cannot be content, in other words, if God has closed all the other doors and shut and locked all the other windows, and has hemmed you in, and you've run away as long as you can, and this is what the Lord has called you to do, then, then, then do it, and God be with you. So there's a call story. Moses was called. It doesn't have to be as dramatic as Moses, but there ought to be a moment or an encounter or an experience or a confirmation that God has looked upon you for this. Now, I'll tell you why that's important. It's not, a, it's not only important to get you started. It's important to keep you going. Because if you don't have an absolute conviction that this is the work to which God has called you, then the work itself will give you enough reasons to quit that you will leave. It's not the highest paying job. It doesn't bring all of the benefits that other vocations might bring, and then there are the people. <laughs> then the, <laughs> the Lord's people are the Lord's people. But if you've been called, then every now and then when you start to lean toward the exit, the call anchors you and reminds you of why you are here. That's the first one, it's the call. The second, the second point with Moses is the character. God does not call perfect people. 
God, there was only one person who ever served God perfectly, and he was of God. I and my father are one. If you cannot say that, then you don't belong in that category. We are of the flawed. But God does not hold the flaws against us. God calls us despite our flaws. In fact, God uses us particularly because of them. Because we are now in a position to be able to identify with the weaknesses and the, uh, uh, the shortcomings of the people with whom we serve and to whom we preach. Moses was an 80-year-old fugitive from justice with a stammering tongue. 80 years old, never too old. Fugitive. Looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. Stammering tongue. You don't have to have all of the physical attributes that other people have. God can use you just as you are. So that your character, not your perfection, but your character. Don't, don't run from your sins. Talk about them. Be honest with them. Don't act as if you never had a past. Folk will find out. I told this story not long ago. Uh, my father died when I was 25, but he had left us when I was 10. So all the people who knew me after the age of 10 never really knew my father. But when he died, uh, a young woman from my past, between 10 and 25, came to my father's funeral. I couldn't figure out what she was doing there because she didn't know him, and I had not seen her in about five or six years or more. But, but uh, she said, I didn't come, I didn't come to uh, pay my respects to your father, though I do. I really, came to, I really came to ask you something. Because she said, I heard that you are now a preacher. That's what I heard. And I came to find out how you got from where we were <laughs> to where you say you are. And all I could say to her was, uh, no, then she said, because I know you. Well, there's no, there's no denying that she did. So all I could say was, her name was Philistine Harris. So, Philistine, all I can say is that you don't know me. You just knew me. <laughs> so that in honoring what she knew, I was not hiding, but what a wonderful change in my life had been wrought <laughs> since Jesus came into my heart. I could preach right there. I could put a pen right there and say floods of joy, oh my soul, but I won't. Like a sea billows roll, but I won't. Since Jesus came into my heart. Yes, well, well, no, I won't do that. Okay. So there's character. But now I want to come to this, this third stuff, this third stuff, which is the content. Call, get you started. Character. You know, it's who you present yourself to be. But content is what God gave Moses. Yeah. It's very clear instruction. Go tell Pharaoh. Don't ask him. Don't beseech him. Don't placate him. Don't build up his ego, uh, uh, Mr. Pharaoh, sir. Pardon my abruptness, if you don't mind, but I'd like to communicate the wishes of God if it doesn't offend you. No, you just go tell him a liberation message. Tell him to let my people go. Now, he won't, he won't give in the first time. 
in fact, by Exodus chapter 10, after you've told him and he's refused seven times, he will tell you in Exodus 10, the next time I see your face, you will surely die. And the next day, Moses came back. So it's a question now of content. It is the what God is calling us to say through the character that we present. Now the final two points are context. Moses' context was not a Sunday morning sanctuary service. If the only place you can preach is in your church <laughs> with your people and a Hammond organ to back you up, but you can't go anywhere else in the name of the Lord, you need to go back to school and learn some more. <laughs> Context, how useful can you be to God? Where can God send you and you'll go because the Lord has sent you there? God is already there. He's just waiting for us to show up. Amen. So it's context. And then it's consequences. What, what happens when you tell Pharaoh? Okay. So what I want to do today now is take that fifth, or that third middle step of content. And I'm, the, the book I'm writing now tries to trace the evolution of liberation theology from James Cone to the Me Too movement on this premise that every voice since Cone has been saying after they heard him, Me Too. You advocated for liberation on the issues of race. Subsequent voices, subsequent movements will say, I, now I heard you on race, but me too on something different. And that what our content needs to reflect is that, that liberation theology, while it may have begun as a black theology, where the issue was, you know, sort of God is advocating on behalf of the oppressed whose oppression is defined primarily on matters of race, that subsequent movements have said, well, yeah, but poverty is also an issue in Latin America. And gender is also an issue with feminist theology. And gender, race, and class are issues for womanist theology. And for people who come from colonialized nations in Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, post-colonial people said, me too, me too. My, my oppression was different than yours, but I've got a story to tell. And then Native Americans, the original Americans have, have more recently come along with a Native American theology of sovereignty that the earth really is the Lord's and that God really does remain sovereign over all of creation and therefore they say, me too. And then for many Christians, the most troublesome next me too is the LGBTQIA, yeah, you know, me too. And then the last two movements are birthed outside of the church. Why did Black Lives Matter have to find its home outside of the church? Why, why didn't the church leaders in St. Louis see that one coming and, and, and be a part of it in its early stages as opposed to waiting till the young people were on the street and then meet them in the street and offer them to take it over. And then, me too. The me too movement. Sexual harassment, sexual assault 
unequal wages, unfair treatment in the media. So, so what, I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm arguing is that what Jim Cohn started in 1969, and the, 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 the sort of the, the gen genesis for this is that this is the 50th anniversary of black theology and black power. And he was my academic, ad my academic advisor. And I was the babysitter for his children. And he installed me at my first church in New Jersey. And he just died. So why not talk about James Cohn? But only as a starting point. What, what Cohn, I don't think, ever thought about, never gave much attention to, was that he was not trying to end a conversation. He was just trying to start one. So, so um, four courageous encounters. These were the questions that Cohn was debating in the 1960s. Can you be both black and Christian in the United States during the 1960s? When the white church was ignoring you, when the black Muslim community was offering an alternative faith tradition, and when the young people in the civil rights movement, Stokely Carmichael and others, were saying, you guys are too slow, you're too old, you are, you are out of step. Cone was trying to find a justification for why black people should not leave the church and go somewhere else. Now, in my hometown of Chicago, I live two blocks from um, uh, Elijah Muhammad's Temple Number no. Two on 79th, off of Cottage Grove. I was at 77th and Cottage Grove. The barber that I went to was a Muslim, Black Nation of Islam. That's why I'm bald today, because <laughs> when I did not join, they put a spell on me. They, every time I went to the chair, the barber was whispering in my ear, brother, you know you ought to join the nation. You ought to join the nation. You ought to join the nation. I had the perfect answer. My mama won't let me. I, my mama won't let me. <laughs> well, you know, he wasn't going to argue with mama, so I was, I, was, I was exempted. So his first point was, how do we keep black people in the church and not turned off? Because white Christians, black Muslims, and young black activists were pulling in other directions. Question number two, why in the world were white scholars, both biblical and theological, mute on the issues of race? Mute. Not subtle. Silent. In Combs, next to the last book, but the last one released while he was alive, The Cross from the Lynching Tree, he dissects Reinhold Niebuhr. The most noted of the white um, sort of Christian ethicists of the time, who was vocal on issues of labor relations, on issues of poverty for the working class in Detroit in the 1920s and 30s, outspoken on matters of war and peace, of course, coined the whole notion of the nature and destiny of man, moral man, immoral society. I mean, he had a clear sense of uh, the things of God, but he never said a word about the racial issues in this country. When there were race riots in Detroit when he was there, he never said a word. When they were trying to pass an anti-lynching bill in 1923-24, he never said a word. So part of Cohn's frustration was, I cannot get white theologians to read the Bible in ways that allow them to see God has a stake in those who are the marginalized, the dispossessed, or the victims of violence. Third question he had was, what does a black person with a PhD do in the civil rights era? Because Martin King had a PhD in systematic theology from Boston University, but did not use it 
in an academic setting. He, he instead was led into the civil rights leadership and there he lived until he was 39. So Cone's question was, if you've got a PhD and you're in the throes of a social struggle, do you have the right to be a, to be a scholar, to step back from the front lines, to justify the time it takes to read and write and reflect for both your lectures and for your writing. And so for him, a real personal struggle was, should I be on the front lines of the battle or am I serving God and the community just as well in my isolation? This is the struggle for the black intellectual. Harold Cruz's book of the 19, late 1960s, uh, the, 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 black the crisis of the Negro intellectual. It's where do you take your PhD and apply it? And then, of course, what happens when black theology uh, runs into other non-racial claims of oppression and injustice? Okay, I've covered all of this, so now I'm going to up ahead. So, Cone starts with issues of race. The solution for which is the end of racism. But then in Latin America and South America, liberation theology as, an, as a clear uh, step beyond black theology and issues of race emerges. Where the question is poverty where Gustavo Gutierrez, among others, but he most notably, uh, begins to talk about the problems of poverty. All, all theological inquiry, he says, is contextual. You don't, you don't do theology from nowhere. You do theology from your particular somewhere. This was his critique of these white theologians of the 1930s and 40s. They were acontextual. A lot of those fellows were living through the Nazi era, but were mute, except for those who signed the Barman Declaration. But the whole German Lutheran church, you know this better than I do, was co-opted by the Nazi party. There was the confessing church, and there was the German Lutheran church. And they came for the Jews. And I said nothing because I wasn't Jewish. And they came for the Catholics, but I said nothing because I was not a Catholic. And they came for the trade unionists, but I said nothing because I was not a trade unionist. And they came for, the, for the, uh, the gypsies. But I said nothing because I wasn't a gypsy. And then said Martin Niemöller. And they came for me. And there was nobody left to say anything. All theology is contextual. But for Gutierrez, his context was not a matter of the black-white racial divide. It was the intentional and systematic exploitation of the people and the resources of what we so coyly refer to as banana republics. All the disdain with which we look down on Central and South America. There's a wonderful movie, it just crossed my mind, uh, Day After Tomorrow. It's about sudden ice age that sweeps across all of Europe and North America. And the only place for the US government to move in order to continue to function was into a small country in South America. And the president says the people that we once thought inferior have opened their doors to us. So that for Gutierrez, the context was multinational corporations exploiting the resources, underpaying the people. Same thing was true in Africa. 
I mean, what in the world is the Belgian Congo? What is that about? Why are you there? Forcing people into labor for petroleum products, rubber products, natural products from fruit and trees and ground. Yeah, this, is, this was his context. And liberation theology is about economics. Now, you can preach about race all you want, but if you don't also tack on issues of economics, then you have Martin King's classic phrase, you have the right to sit at a lunch counter, but you don't have the money with which to pay for the meal. Our context today, says Gutierrez, is characterized by glaring disparity between the rich and the poor. This is still him. No serious Christian can quietly ignore this situation. It is no longer possible for someone to say, well, I did not know about the suffering of the poor. Poverty has a visibility that it did not have in the past. What have you said lately about poverty? What have you written lately about poverty? What have you done lately about the reality of poverty? Because poverty is not just an issue in South America, Central America, the Caribbean, or where brown and black people live. Poverty is all over this country. And those in power do everything they can to give the impression that it is localized among black and brown people so that the majority of people who are poor in this country, who are white, will never realize they have more in common with their black and brown brothers and sisters than they do with the economic elite of this country who are completely content to exploit us all. This is the question of liberation theology. So far, so good for the average male Christian. <laughs> Nothing to fuss about so far, unless you are Donald Trump, in which case it's all fake news. <laughs> but then the white women coming out of the feminist movement, Gloria Steinem and others, move into the church and raise the questions of feminist theology. This is Christine Smith from United Seminary in uh, Minneapolis. Sexism involves the systemic denial, exploitation, and oppression of women as the hierarchical structuring of personal and social reality, sexism assures and secures male domination. Men go out of their way to make sure that women stay in their place. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you, sisters. <laughs> so you're very outspoken on issues of race. You are, you, are, you are sensitive to issues of poverty. But, 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 but liberation theology moves on. You're stuck in the 1965 argument about race. When the wealth gap in this country at this moment continues to be staggering. But, but, but the discussion moves on to issues of gender, which include, by the way, not just issues of leadership in the church, but also reproductive rights. Why, why are committees of old white men in Congress <laughs> deciding what a woman can and cannot do with her own body? Now, whatever, whatever a woman chooses to do between her and God and her doctor, I'm not going to get in the middle of that, but the whole point is I should not be in the middle of that. And if you don't want government intruding in your life on other matters, we don't want big government, well then what are you doing in the bedroom? Why, why do you want to have a law about this? 
You see, but, but, but the farther we get from race, fewer and fewer black people want to travel. Because black people are disproportionately liberal on issues of race and really disproportionately conservative on all of the rest that I'm getting ready to talk about. So I'm going to get fewer and fewer. <laughs> Amens. But I'm now conditioned against it, so it doesn't really matter. So you've got, you've got leadership in the church, reproductive rights, wage disparities, same job, different pay. And then you've got sexual violence. And the depiction and treatment of women in popular culture, especially in pornography. And you've got the groper in chief. <laughs> sitting in the White House, offering a defense of a Supreme Court justice who is known to have revealed himself to women and who hosted Jeffrey Epstein at Mar-a-Lago. That's okay, because if you have enough money, you can do whatever you want, hence white privilege. But the privilege is escalated as you are white and wealthy. And we go on. To womanist theology and to what Jacqueline Grant, one of my classmates when I was a student at Union, uh, called the tri-dimensional experience of liberation. Bad enough to be a victim of race. Bad enough to be a victim of gender. Add on to that the additional challenge of being a poor black woman trying to raise children by yourself in a capitalistic and patriarchal culture, like my mother. My father left us when I was 10. She left, he left us with her, and she carried on nobly. But it wasn't her choice. Here was her dilemma. She was a world-class pianist and organist, almost uh, uh, you know, from birth, just naturally inclined to this. She played for the church, she played for the choir, she played organ, she played piano, she led two or three different groups. She was a tremendous musician. She was a prodigy. But in 1931, 32, when she was the valedictorian of her high school class. And the custom was that the valedictorian could perform in the commencement program. And they could give a speech or play their instrument or whatever they wanted to do. And it was her right to do that. She was not allowed to participate because she was an African American. And in 1931, 32, black People could not be on the commitment. They could graduate, but they couldn't say anything. So she was a victim of race. Well, when my dad left, she was trying to increase her skill set so that she could earn more as a musician. So she applied to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. I emphasize the middle word. <laughs> Moody Bible <laughs> Institute. Now, she didn't buy into their theology. She wanted to go to their organ school. All she wanted to do was just expand her musical capacities. But she was not admitted to Moody Bible Institute, not because she was black, but because she was divorced. So gender kicked in. She told them, I did not leave him. He walked out on us. No matter. So there she was in Chicago trying to raise two sons with no husband 
and father. And so I saw womanist theology up close and personal. What does it mean to be a black woman living in poverty, left with a household finance corporation indebtedness of 26.5% interest? To pay off the debt in which my father left us. I made more money in my first job as an assistant pastor in 1972 than she made at the end of her career as medical record secretary at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago. Womanist theology. And it is in the church, the black church, the, the, the freedom church, the liberation church, the, uh, you know, we want justice. No justice, no peace. <laughs> when the sisters show up to say, we've got a voice and a calling and a gifting. It's not white people who tell them no. It's the same thing that Jarena Lee said to Richard Allen in 1802. God has called me to preach. And he said, there is nothing in our theology about women preaching. And 200 plus years later, we're still, in, still telling women what we think the Lord has said. Each church has to define this for themselves. All I'm saying is, me too. Just when you're ready to stop because you got your point over. Somebody else said, wait a minute. Me too. And then the church has to decide the degree to which it will go along. What's my time? I'm a Baptist, you know. I'm a <laughs> I have five minutes. Oh, Lord, have mercy. All right, buy the book. Um, I don't know what else I can tell you. I just, I just give you a thumbnail sketch of the next one. So post-colonial theology says that it is one thing to have been black in America where at least you are living in your home country as a racial minority. That's one set of experiences. It is altogether different to be black in South Africa. Well, you are the majority, but you are being dominated by a group of people of a different race, or in the case of the Belgian Congo, they don't even live here. They just, they just, they just stake a claim here, and by the way, they have exported the notion of white supremacy. So wherever white people are, that is where the right thing is. White music, white art, white music, white culture, white preaching, white prayer, white this, white that. And, and it gets drilled into you that you are fundamentally inferior. That all of your pre-existing beliefs about God and beauty and culture are of no worth and value. So that these two strange words kicked in. The Christianization and the civilization of black and brown people by white people by any means necessary. And then people in Africa and Asia say, oh, me too. I gotta find a way to talk about God from my particular experience. And then Native Americans said, now wait a minute. All of you are newcomers. I'm going to just give you this one illustration. There were some Navajo Indians who served in World War II as uh, code talkers. They would communicate positions and so forth and so on, coordinates, in the Navajo language. And the Japanese couldn't translate it. Or wind talkers. wind talkers. So two years ago, Donald Trump was going to honor the surviving members of the wind talkers at a 
he vetted in the White House. And two things happened. One, he stood in front of a picture of Andrew Jackson, <laughs> who in 1830 authorized the Indian Removal Act that forced all of the Indians from the east side of the Mississippi River to the west side of the Mississippi River under Army Guard. And during that time, you had what was called the Trail of Tears. Cherokee Indians just dropping dead along the way. Going from Georgia to Oklahoma. In the same day, he refers to Senator Elizabeth Warren as Pocahontas. He's not just a racist. He's not just a sexist. He's a, he's a global bigot. Simultaneously offending everybody who isn't at least as rich as he is. And so Native Americans say, wait, we too. They tried to enslave us first. We knew where to run to hide from. But they took all we had, and genocide was the solution. Bury my heart at wounded knee. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Lakota Sioux men, women, children, and the elderly were shot to death by the United States Army. And they say, me too. Last one. Not white. Queer theology. Now, this is their term, not mine. So, but the, but 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 the but the issue here is, what does it mean to live in a patriarchal culture that celebrates pornography and the exploitation of women as a person who is either yourself lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender? or identifying, or whatever the other letters might be, or one of their allies. What do you say to people about Leviticus 18.22? Or Romans 1, 25, 26? Folks are always quoting Leviticus to me. My response is, how much Leviticus do you really want? Do, I mean, do you, want, do you want all of Leviticus? Do you want the part about don't eat shellfish? Don't wear clothes made out of two different kinds of material? Don't touch the corpse of a dead body? Don't be with your wife during her menstrual cycle? Here's, here's a wonderful visual for you. Uh, two, two people who are anti-gay going to Red Lobster wearing silk and wool suits telling each other that to be LGBT is sinful. <laughs> really? That's all you got? And in Romans 1, you know, God has given them over to this and this and the Yeah, keep reading. Keep, keep, keep reading. You'll get your, we'll get to you in a minute. Gossip, backbiting, <laughs> jealousy, strife, envy. Keep reading. So, so, so whatever your views are up to this point, Somebody else says, me too. To find out whether or not we will follow them into their pain area. And then Black Lives Matter and Me Too movement. The, 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 sort of the two concurrent issues. Which for me is con it's, it's, it's challenging because I have a lot of friends who are really in the St. Louis area. They're, they're still living Michael Brown. But I just, you know, I just say to you, since Michael Brown was shot by a policeman in the last year in St. Louis, 20 black children have been shot by black people. And nobody from the Black Lives Matter movement has convened a rally in the street 
to address that. So I'm using the Black Lives Matter movement as a point of reference to say, which Black Lives Matter? Does it matter only if you are shot by a policeman, or does it matter that you are killed, period? And then Me Too, the, the, the current Me Too movement. The growing list of people who are being exposed for decades of sexual assault against women, and to some degree, the growing list of men who are the uh, victims of assault by men and women. And they say me too. So I'm going to stop with this. What James Cone started when he said God is on the side of the oppressed, 50 years later, God hadn't moved. There's a story, Baptist preacher, got to tell a story about a couple that was sitting in a car. And uh, the car at the red light in front of them, uh, the man and woman were sitting so close together they were almost in one seat. Just all huddled up together. And the folk in the back said, honey, the wife said to the husband, honey, remember when we used to sit like that? And the man behind the steering wheel said, well, I never moved. I behind the wheel then, I behind the wheel now. Somebody moved, but it wasn't me. God was behind the wheel in 1969. God is behind the wheel today, trying to find out if we have moved. I want to just make two announcements. Give you seven minutes for Q&A. Seven minutes. Only because last year when we had this, we didn't have Q&A and I got rebuked. <laughs> Dr. Tyson. And um, so, um, but if you have to leave, oh yeah, you're free, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you do have to leave, we do understand, and uh, if you want to give a gift, you can put it in the basket or course give online. And I don't know if they could show the online giving. And then this evening at 7 o'clock. Now, you heard a lecture. Uh, remember when Dr. Mapson lecture, and he defined what lecturing is in the black church culture? You, you really heard a sermon in a lecture in one. But you'll hear a real sermon this evening at 7 o'clock. And so we invite you to Grace Baptist Church of Germantown at 7 p.m. This is the church that Reverend Dr. James Buck serves as pastor, but it is the church that the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Sr. served as pastor for 42 years, who was one of our first African-American graduates. So Dr. McMickle, if you will come up, and I'm just going to stand behind you like a time clock. Yes, sir. Um, and you can choose, and no, I you think choose. we, oh, you want, oh, you, oh, wow, he gave me power. Are there any questions from the floor? And, and please let me just say questions. <laughs> no, no, no lecture from you, just, just, just a question so he can answer the question. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. They're bringing the mic to you. Um, they didn't know it was going to be that far. introspection and for the breadth of what you presented. But my question is, with all of this that you presented, do you have any suggestions for next steps? For next steps? Yeah. I think each movement, each, each successive Me Too 
has its own inherent next steps. Don't be a racist is the first one. <laughs> Do not contribute to or be silent about the realities of poverty. So how about a living wage? Yeah. Child care, affordable health care to address issues of poverty. Don't be a sexist. Don't deny women voice or place in their workplace. Do not contribute to the already burdensome life of poor African American women who are trying to make it in a, as, as Jacqueline Grant calls it, in a capitalistic and patriarchal culture. Uh, don't, don't have a colonial patriarchal view, if you're white, of people in other parts of the world. Why? I'm just, I mean, you can see that politically I have a certain orientation here. But I'm, I, why were you throwing out paper towels to a hurricane in Puerto Rico? But sending money and resources for the same hurricane in Texas and Florida and Louisiana. It's because the people in one place matter to you. But the American citizens in another place were just so much, eh, who cares? Uh, so each movement has its own answer to that question. Native Americans say, don't run pipelines leaking oil through South Dakota and North Dakota that defile our sacred lands and ruin the water supply of six states. Don't, don't do that. And don't be silent while it is being done. LGBT people say, this is who we are, not what we have chosen to do. Honor us in our identity and our reality, and don't foreclose the notion that we can serve God just as well as any heterosexual can. Now, this is a big step for lots of folks, because like racism and sexism, we have had ingrained in us a certain sense about human sexuality, but they have their own answers. So I, don't have to, I don't have to make them up, I just tell you, so right across the board, go back to the movement that you want to talk about and listen to them. They'll tell you exactly what they want to have done. Right here, Yvonne. Yvonne. Thank you so much. Microphone. Thank you so much, Dr. McMichael, for an outstanding lecture and just broadening our perspective. I wanted to just rewind a little bit back, and Dr. Mapson mentioned in his introduction of you about looking to someone's mentors to get an understanding about them. If you could uh, speak a little bit about James Cone's uh, theological mentors. And I'm thinking back on some, I guess they would be proto-liberation proto theologians like uh, Daniel Payne, who has a big part to play in the history here at the seminary back in the um, Civil War era, Frederick Douglass, the Grimke sisters being sort of proto-feminist theologians, but very yeah. interested in hearing about yeah, the yeah. influences. Uh, while I'm sure he was aware of them, it's pretty clear to me that his three most formative voices were, first of all, Henry McNeil Turner, uh, AME Bishop, politician, uh, Pan-Africanist, but who coined the notion that God is a Negro in the 1890s. Howard Thurman, primarily because of the book Jesus and the Disinherited. But then really I think it's pretty clear that C. Eric Lincoln, uh, who was just ahead of him in terms of the scholarly world, was an enormous influence in his life, uh, urged him to write his first book, proofread his first book, you know, added to it enormously, and brought him to Union. It was, it was C. Eric Lincoln who brought him to Union and advocated for him when he was going against the grain of what everybody else at Union was teaching. And, uh, and that, that James Cone got tenure at Union and that his, that his tenure lecture was on the spirituals and the blues is an indication of where he was and where Eric Lincoln helped to steer him. Those are, I would name those three. One more question. 
Thank you, Dr. McMichael. It seems like I'm, I'm following you around the United States. I saw you in Minneapolis this summer. Ah, yes. at the Festival of Homiletics. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, as you're, you're showing the different theologies that come out of the oppressed or the people that are feeling like they have been marginalized, it seems to me that there's a piece about um, self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. And how do we teach that from the pulpit and in the mm -hmm. academy? Because a lot of um, us that go into our churches, we start doing the same thing that the world is doing. Mm -hmm. So how do we change that as we're um, grooming and growing new theologians and pastors and just people? Mm -hmm. My greatest fear, thank you, that's a wonderful question. I have to tell my wife that you're following me around the country. So, uh, <laughs> so she'll know, so she'll know. Um, I'm afraid that the church has fallen under the spell of the world's idea of success. And therefore, you will do those things, embrace those practices, avoid certain things, refrain from speaking about some things, because you are, you are, you are pursuing a kind of success. I've, I've said to younger preachers, I said, why don't you all do this, this, and this? I said, man, I can't blow up my church if I do that. Mm -hmm. I thought he meant explosion, <laughs> blow it up. But he means, how do I quickly swell a membership and work on my, what's this term they use these days? My, my identity? No, my, my brand. Yeah, my brand. I got a brand. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> My brand. See, because, because you, are, you are into marketing of yourself. Mm. It's going to be hard to pull back from that because it's happening at the highest levels. See, everybody you see on TV is working on a brand. So you want to be like that. But then you get stuck with Paul. Follow me only as I follow Christ. That's the only way that I know of. But now, so I'm not working on a brand. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, my, my old friend, now deceased Charles Booth, uh, said, I'm going to just keep preaching till preaching comes back in style. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to leave it to, to reinvent myself. I'm going to just keep doing this. Yep. And like that old suit in my wardrobe that I hadn't worn in 20 years, sooner or later, those big wide lapels, <laughs> those little skinny ties, you know. So I got some of that right here in my closet, yeah. So I'm, I'm perpetually in style because I kept all my old stuff. Yeah. Except my bell-bottom jeans. I don't think I kept those. Yeah, we, we, have to, we have to be very careful of what we identify as success. And if it's too much like the world, then, then what's the point? We have to be in it, but not us. That was the goal. Somewhere along the way, we wanted to be popular. Let me, let me give you one more summary. There's always a, I'm looking for a test. Okay, so, so in Mark 15, uh, the people are clamoring for the death of Jesus. Crucify, crucify. And Pilate says, why? What has he done? So he's innocent. Then it says, kind of subtext, because he knew that they were, meaning the Pharisees, were jealous of him. So there were two sort of issues here. One, the judge thinks the man is innocent, and the judge knows that the accusations are coming from the jealous. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then the text says, but Pilate, Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Gave Jesus over to be flogged. And crucified. So I asked my 
myself the question, why did my Savior die, except, of course, for the sake of my sins? What was the process? The mm. process was because there was somebody who was more interested in being popular than he was in being faithful. And that is a dilemma that all of us have to navigate for ourselves. Again, I want to thank you for coming and invite you this evening. Um, before we leave, because this is the anniversary, uh, our two founders were both the late Reverend Dr. Randolph Jones and Bishop Willis. And I see their wives here. So would they both please stand so we can honor them. <laughs> Bishop Andrew Willis and Dr. Randy Jones. Thank you, thank you for coming today. Again, I want everybody to feel important, so as we prepare for the benediction, I want everybody that's important to stand up. That's everybody. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I'm important. <laughs> Before you leave, also know that Judson Press is outside with books by Dr. McMickle. He's a nice, isn't he a nice man? He's willing to autograph the books that you brought. Now, I was smart. I already had my books, so I got them signed already. If you don't have a book, you don't have to go to Amazon. You can go right outside, get a book, and he will sign it. I invite now the Reverend Dr. Wayne E. Croft, who is Associate Professor in Homiletics and Liturgics, who holds the seat of the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Chair. May the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, be with us all until we meet again. The Lord be with you. Also with you. See you this evening. <laughs>